Well, hello friends and welcome to Stamp Chat. My name is Heidi Rhodes. Thank you so much for joining us on this premiere of APS Stamp Chat, the future of philately. We're kicking it off this time with online exhibiting. It's something that's very near and dear to collectors and we decided that it was high time that we address it. Where philately's learning curve is steepest is in the area of exhibiting primarily because of how difficult it is for the uninitiated to actually see and learn from exhibits without physically attending an, exhi uh, an exhibition. Strangely, we have COVID to thank you to thank for philately finally starting to catch up to the digital age and to make exhibitions and exhibits available to the public from their comfort of their home. It's a process that should have started 20 years ago and to be sure, there will be a period of internet chaos as webmasters and exhibition organizers adapt to each other and struggle to develop a common formula for presenting and cataloging exhibits. But it feels like there's a changing of the guard happening and a new generation of collectors is slowly gaining influence and breathing new energy into the hobby. And this is where we begin today on the future of philately virtual exhibiting. Our esteemed international panel of judges and webmasters are here to answer your questions and address your concerns regarding online exhibiting. As we, I'd like to welcome, please, we have Mr. Peter Allen joining us. He's the current uh -huh. president of the Australian Philatelic Society and he joins us from Tasmania, Australia. We have Mr. Bill Barrell. He's a longtime dealer and a committee member of the Philatelic Traders Society of London. He joins us from the UK. Mr. Larry Fillion from Boston, Mass. He's the webmaster of the American Association Philatelic Exhibitors and the current president of Malaria Philatelists International. Ms. Elizabeth Liz Heisey joins us from Sarasota. Ms. Heisey is the chairman of the APS Committee for Accreditation. Mr. Ross Jones is the webmaster from the American Philatelic Society and joins us from ben Belfont, Pennsylvania. Mr. Beruz Nazre initiated the Iran Philatelic S Study Circle's first virtual exhibition, and he joins us from San Francisco, California. And Mr. Joel Weiner, vice president of the Society of Israel Philatelists and director of the Royal Philatelic Society of Canada. He joins us from Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. Thank you so much for joining us from all around the world. We're really excited. Now, friends, before we begin, uh, we're going to invite each of our presenters to tell us a little bit more about their affiliations and their involvement with online or virtual exhibiting. Let's start with Mr. Peter Allen, please. Hi, everybody. Just give me a minute and I'll see if I can do this share screen thing here. Uh, you have to find it. Uh, okay, that's working. Uh, try and keep this brief. I'm currently the president of the Australian Philatelic Federation, which is the body for organised philately in Australia. Uh, I'm one of the directors and we're elected by the uh, state councils in Australia. Uh, I've sort of come to virtual exhibiting through a number of channels that seem to have come together. I'm a collector of uh, Tasmania in particular, uh, Paris postal history, French colonies postal history. I've been an exhibitor for about 10 years at the national and international level. I'm currently a national level judge in Australia. Uh, with disciplines in postal history, revenues, postcards and literature. And uh, a few years, well, 12 years ago, I had a career change and went back to further education and became a web designer. Uh, did a course in web design, multimedia, um, and worked as a contractor for some years. And because of my interest in philatelic matters, of course, I've ended up building a number of philatelic websites for the APF and a number of other uh, national and international societies. Um, last year, we obviously had problems with our exhibition timetable due to COVID. 
So we uh, implemented a one frame virtual exhibition uh, in Australia and New Zealand. Uh, pretty much put this together myself from uh, a technical point of view. I was also the exhibition secretary. We had 67 one frame exhibits. We took the opportunity to survey the judges and the exhibitors at the end of the process, uh, just to see what everybody made of it. So we have a little bit of data to go forward based on real life experience. And um, without going into detail, the exhibition was quite a success. We had very positive feedback from exhibitors. We made a couple of mistakes. We learned a couple of things and we will revise our syllabus um, next time, our prospectus, I should say, next time we do this. And maybe through the discussion, I can talk about a few ideas that came out of our experience. But uh, look, that's me. And uh, I'll leave it there and hand over to the next person. Thank you, Mr. Allen. And may we have Mr. Bill Barrow, please. Yeah. Welcome. Hi. Hi, Heidi. I'm, I'm Bill Barrow from the UK. Uh, exhibitor, collector, and international dealer in GB postal history and stamps. Um, I've been collecting for 40, 50 years, exhibiting uh, for the last couple. Uh, got a uh, large gold at uh, Stockholm yeah, for, for classic GB. Um, I also, more importantly, in, in terms of this evening, I, I sit on the, the Philatelic Traders Society Council. That's the uh, emblem up here. Uh, which side is it? <laughs> up, up, upper right. Um, I, I sit on the Philatelic Traders Society Council uh, and in the UK, one of our, our, our main pleasures is to organise the uh, physical stamp X show twice a year. That was pre-COVID, of course. Um, COVID, of course, has, 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 changed, has changed everything. Uh, and I also sit on the PTS small subcommittee of five people that organises our virtual stamp X show uh, which organised the virtual stamp at show last October. It was seen as a great success. Uh, we too were on a massive learning curve um, and we are in the process now of organising uh, a bigger, more successful, more interactive uh, second virtual stamp X for this March. Um, so that, that's, that's what I will bring to this meeting is um, experience of actually organizing, delivering, and, and having a high profile presence at virtual Stampex. I, I, am, I, I am personally very keen uh, to, to enhance the virtual exhibiting aspect of virtual Stampex. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Barrow. And Mr. Larry Fillion, please, welcome. Thank you very much. I'm Larry Fillion. I've been exhibiting for 15 years. I've uh, been webmaster for about 20 of the American Association of Philatelic Exhibitors and about 12 other stamp websites. Uh, I've been doing software for 30 years. Uh, let me share my screen and let me just show you what, um, in general, what we have. For the last 15 years I've had, we have about 200 exhibits on the AAPE, which is short for American Association of Philatelic Exhibitors website. In general, um, what we've been doing there is we have the frame view and you can click from frame to frame. And then once you're in there, you can click on the image and then go from page forwards and backwards, whichever you want. For uh, a few months ago, we had the single frame champion of champions uh, competition. And I just had a drop down to show all of the uh, exhibits in that list. And this one was more directed towards the judges versus a viewer in the sense of the judges want a frame view of what they can see as if they were standing back from the single frame. And the synopsis for all the exhibits are linked there. And then there's a PDF linked from it also instead of being able to click on it so that it could be downloaded to your um, computer and then from there using Adobe's view of scale in to however large you want seeing as that company spends 50 million dollars on scaling in and out I have them do the work for me instead of using JavaScript and what have you um, for doing the scale in and scale out and then in this view obviously you go from page to page down the exhibit. 
Thank you. Thank you. And Ms. Liz Heisey, welcome. Good afternoon from Sarasota, Florida. Um, I'm wearing here two, two hats today. One is the logo behind me. Um, due to COVID, we should have been, or had it not been for COVID, we would have been having a physical show this coming weekend. But back at the beginning of November, we decided that, that wasn't going to be feasible. And so we decided to go virtual. Um, we have 30 exhibits. They have been judged by three judges and uh, they were awarded um, points, ribbons and certificates. Um, and this weekend we are going to be having three days of seminars of um, various societies that we're going to meet down here in Sarasota. So I do encourage you to visit www.sarasotanationalstampexhibition.com.org, sorry, and click in and take part in some of our seminars. Now, if I can share my other. Yeah. Sorry. Good go. Well, obviously it's not going to come up. My other hat, as um, Heidi introduced me, is that I'm the chairman of the Committee of Accreditation of National Judges and Exhibitions. I am an international judge. I'm a chief judge here in the States. I've been exhibiting for 20 years, uh, both nationally and internationally. My background is display open class postcards. And with Canage, uh, we have oversight of all the exhibitions and the judges in the US. And this is something very close to us at the moment as to uh, the future of virtual philately and how it impacts judges, how it impacts exhibitors. Uh, there have been several virtual um, exhibitions. Uh, Larry mentioned the AAP single frame. The Collectors Club of New York had a single frame competition. The German Philatelic Salon had a minor mini uh, exhibition. So we've been collecting um, data, and, and I've been also talking to Peter, about the experience of the judges and the exhibitors. Um, so this weekend is going to be really interesting. It seems to me that one of the problems, and I think, again, we can, this is something we're going to be doing between all of us, is trying to find a standard uh, method for stamp shows to upload their exhibits. Uh, we don't necessarily all have Peter and Larry who are that, or Ross, who are that well uh, techie, if I might say. And so we um, had a very good guy who was done an awesome job using WordPress on our website. And he got all 30 exhibits up and they are viewable and the judging uh, went well. So I look for, forward to further to uh, chatting with you all and seeing what's going on. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Ross Jones, welcome. All right. Well, I, uh, I'm here from the uh, American Philatelic Society, uh, just like Heidi. And here we're going to share my screen. Uh, this is the uh, exhibits that were displayed during the virtual stamp show of, of 2020. Um, we ended up with 113 exhibits, uh, you know, both single and multi frame exhibits. Uh, we had a, a very nice, uh, you know, uh, flip through display. I, I would agree with you know every every other person here who worked on on designing a virtual exhibit. You know we all sort of started from scratch, or, or with a you know a basic premise. Um, so there was definitely a learning curve. Uh, there are a lot of a lot of interesting things uh, that that we look at and, and are planning to do a little differently in 2021. Um, but I, I do want to say that that uh, this was a, a an incredible success. Uh, in, in terms of, of numeric value, we had a little over 5,000 people look at virtual exhibits online for the virtual stamp show of 2020, which is uh, just a, a pretty exciting number, especially for something that was uh, brand new and, and minimally, minimally tried before. All right, Heidi, we'll pass it on to the next. All right, thank you, Ross. And Mr. Joel Wiener, welcome. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, hope you're seeing me okay. I'm not okay. muted. I'm okay? Yes, yes, okay. I'm coming through. If I can see the APS uh, 
logo on here. I'm going to try it. and um, share my screen. Well, I'm a uh, philatelic uh, exhibitor and judge. I've been a, an exhibitor for um, oh, since the mid '90s. I've been a judge for about 20 years. Uh, a national judge for the uh, Royal Philatelic Society of uh, of Canada. And uh, if I can get to the screen share here, uh, where is it? Slideshow. Hopefully, has that come up for everyone? The other one, actually. Yeah, that's fine. That looks oh. good, Joel. Okay. Well, yeah, because I, I see everybody's picture and stuff like that. All right. Well, the Royal Philatelic Society of Canada is um, Canada's national stamp collecting organization. And I chair a committee in Canada for the Royal. That's very similar to the one that Liz described uh, for, for the APS. And uh, we had a, um, a lot of requests for Canadian exhibitors and to be able to qualify for CAPEX 22. CAPEX 22 is a new effort. It's an international one frame exhibit that will be held in Toronto in uh, June of 2022. It's a, um, and people needed to be able to qualify for this. So after a number of discussions within the uh, uh, committee we ha have and, and the Royal, uh, we decided to host a, um, a one frame national exhibit, but it's not really national, it's international. Anyone can, can exhibit. And this is called Canpex. It's being organized by uh, Steve Johnson and um, John Sheffield in uh, London, Ontario. Uh, you can see the dates there. It's going to be held in April. Uh, the deadline for submission of exhibits is March 8th. So if you're thinking about doing a one frame exhibit, uh, this is your opportunity. It will be judged by, by national judges. It will be scored so that those that receive a um, Vermeer or higher will be eligible to, um, to to submit an application to to uh, for, for Capex 22. Now, I'm the uh, Commissioner General for Capex 22. So if you have any questions about that exhibit, you can contact me. My uh, contact information is there, and uh, I'm uh, looking forward to the uh, discussion we're gonna we're gonna have this morning because um, it's something uh, virtual exhibiting is something I've I thought a lot about and what its future will be after COVID and how we we maintain the same interest when people can get back to uh, going to their favorite show. Thank you. And thank you so much. And and just to you know segue in back into Canada, I'd like you to know that uh, we had an, a, a comment come in that said, "I did my first exhibit in December 2020 for a virtual exhibit put on by a club in Toronto." I liked it. I think it is preferable, honestly, as there is zero opportunity to exhibit in my city, Southern Alberta, and few chances within a day's drive. A virtual exhibit let me submit without the cost of travel or contracting a potentially fatal illness. There were, was no fear of sending my items through the post to strangers either. It also allowed me to begin exhibiting without being as self-conscious as I would have been if I were there in person. Putting together an exhibit was rather intimidating. I received good feedback from the judges and didn't have to deal with the attitude of people who often look down on collections that are not of their interest. So I think that there's a lot of great interest and I'd like to invite our friends who are on today's webinar to use the Q&A box to send your questions, your thoughts to our judges. Please feel free to use the chat box liberally to talk uh, between participants and do know that uh, contact information for each one of our panelists will be available at the conclusion of today's stamp chat. We did go ahead and put uh, these questions out to social media. So we'll be toggling between live Q&A and some of the thoughts and concerns that we were able to glean from the various APS social media sites. So with that, let's get started. Mm. There are a lot of questions regarding virtual exhibiting that have to be resolved. For instance, if you exhibit virtually, are you actually required to have the item you are showing in your possession? For instance, if I were showing an exhibit on errors, could I show a picture of an inverted Jenny and treat it as if it was in my collection? Somebody needs to come up with some guidelines governing virtual exhibits. Anybody want to take that? I'll take it. Thank you. Uh, no, I mean, that's, that's one of the biggest uh, concerns that people have as to um, what 
people are showing. Um, is it actually theirs or is it a copy? Um, so we are going to have to trust the exhibitors. So no, I mean, putting in something that you don't own um, currently is not the way to go. Um, but that being said, and I think probably this is more towards the end of the conversation, is where is virtual exhibiting going? Are we going to be recreating physical frames and putting them up on the web, on the internet? Or are we going to explore where virtual exhibiting can go out of the box? And that leads to dumb things where maybe you can put in other things that you don't own because it's a different type of exhibiting. Um, so, but currently, you must own, as you do in a physical situation, you must own the item you are showing. If I could just follow on from Liz, we developed a prospectus for our first virtual exhibition and we, we stated very clearly in Australia, you needed to be the owner. Now that does leave the way open uh, and I, I see this as a risk management issue and I don't think it's gonna be at all a major issue. It does leave the way open for people uh, to sometimes cause some doubts as to whether they do own an item or not. So in Australia, we have a network of judges in each state. So our requirement next time will be, if the judges have a query about your exhibit, uh, we reserve the right for somebody in your state to inspect your exhibit physically. And uh, so if we do have any, any worries about um, non-ownership, we could resolve them that way. There is another further question and that is, moving from paper-based exhibits to software-based exhibits. And at least one of our exhibitors put their exhibit together in desktop publishing. They don't, didn't have the stuff mounted on paper. And that makes a very good virtual display. And the, the beauty of that is you can frame your exhibit to match screen dimensions. So instead of having all this extra white space on both sides of the screen, you can show uh, landscape uh, format pages if you wanted to do that and I think Liz has hit the nail on the head about the future and I would say exhibits where you don't own the material could be classed as literature exhibits perhaps but I think that's an area that we'll be exploring in in times to come. Um, I, I just want to comment on it also I am Beruz Nasr, uh, uh, I part of Iran Philatelic State Circle and we started our uh, first online exhibit and with the main focus on getting new exhibitors and out of the 50 exhibit we got 45 people who've never ever exhibited before and, and I don't think getting 45 new exhibitors in one, one show is is I have I've been exhibiting for a very long time and that's quite unusual uh, so to the, this particular point uh, I think uh, we in our initial things we first of all reserve the right to ask for a scan of both sides of any item and then we can also request that that if we have to we want to be able to see the item in person at some one of the judges available uh, so that's one and then the other one is the question was asked about can we resize or does it have to be actual size of the item can I sort of reduce it and show it or people were showing both sides of the item at the same exact size. So we were guiding, since most of them have never exhibited before, we were sort of lenient on this first one, but we were gonna guide them toward not doing that. It should be actual size of the material and it, you certainly have to own it. So that's, that was from the beginning. Thank you. Thank you, Baruz, thank you. All right, uh, we'll take a question from our online participants. Uh, for Liz Heisey, is the US Kane J planning training for judging virtual exhibits? Yes, we're working on that now. Uh, as to whether, I think probably one of the biggest points is time management um, in the fact that when you're at an actual physical show, you do have, you know, hopefully you have six weeks of run up of reading the title pages, synopsis, um, exploring, doing the research on the subject. But when you get to the actual exhibit, you only have maybe eight hours because of the time you, you're on the floor. And what we're finding is that with the virtual judging, people are at home. I mean, and they can spend as many, much time as they like. And so some of them are also uh, Going, what I call going down the rabbit hole, um, a little bit more than possibly um, judging the exhibit for what it is, 
they're being a little bit more picky. Uh, we've had a few instances where um, points have been lower on a virtual exhibit than they were on a physical because the judge had had much more time to um, spend on it. I mean, in a physical exhibit, you hope that, well, you don't hope, but you can sometimes um, get away with having a boo-boo in the middle of it because it, it might not be that, uh, noticed. But on virtual, when people, when judges are going page by page by page, um, the, the boo-boos are going to um, come out. So I think we're going to have to do some time management studies um, and working with the judges. That's why I'm sort of collecting um, data from those who have been judging so that we can come up with some guidelines going forward. Thank you. Bill, I think this is a question for you um, because you, you did a great job with this. If I do say so myself with the PTS, we were mm -hmm. a partner and we're gonna be with you again this year in March. One purpose of shows uh, you know, and conventions is to meet and greet people. How will virtual exhibits handle conventions? Sorry, how will... So how, you know, so it's the meet and greet and how do conventions, you know, how do these virtual conventions handle the meet and greet and the communication between uh, the con well, connecting between collectors? Yeah, it, it's, it, it's obviously a totally different experience. I mean, when, when, when we organized the virtual Stampex last October, it was a massive leap in, in, into the unknown for the, for the, for the Philatelic Traders Society. Uh, we, I, I think I, I can say that uh, we, we were very brave in what we did, um, and right up until the show opened on the first of October, you know the, the the organizing committee of which you know there's only five of us, we we, we were still pretty unsure as as to what we were actually going to deliver and, and what we might and what might happen. Actually, what what actually physic what physically happened was that. The, the connectivity was very successfully handled through um, chat rooms. The, 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 there was uh, each booth had the option for uh, a, we had a, a private chat room and a public chat room, which that the public might not have been aware of that, um, and that, that caused uh, that was a bit of a problem um, because uh, the the main chat room through which people connect initially contacted you was a public chat room. And all that was um, all that was being said was uh, it, it, it was not confidential at all. So what 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 you had to do you had to steer uh, your your client through into a personal chat room, which which worked very very well. Um, the 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 other uh, the, the, the other focus of connectivity we had were the video cameras, which unfortunately there was a lot of reluctance to use that. So 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 so. Going forward, we we found that there's that there's a lot of improvements we can make with connectivity. There's 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 uh, there's the question of confidentiality, which, which uh, we had to improve upon. Um, and what we'd like to do is is to really uh, in, encourage much greater use of um, video uh, cameras, really. Um, but but o o overall, I have to say that I I really enjoyed my experience at. At, at virtual Stampex, it, it was wonderful um, meeting lots and lots of new clients and and, and, enge and and engaging in in chat. Even though at times it was absolutely manic, I have to say I, I was engaging in. Uh, I, I was probably communicating with with fifteen different people at, at, at some stage, particularly during the Greenwich Mean Time hours. Uh, what we found actually in in terms of um, connectivity is that everything happened during Greenwich Mean Time hours, and that in terms of connection with collectors in Australia or the west coast of America, they contacted us during um, Greenwich Mean Time. So there's, 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 uh, it was very successful, but, but there's, there's a lot of scope for improvement, Heidi, with, with, which is what we're going to in, introduce um, this March. I hope that answers the question. I, uh, and Liz, go ahead. Um, yeah, I was one of the booth sitters for the Royal Philatelic Society. And that was very, a very interesting experience because here <laughs> I was in St. Sarasota. Mm -hmm. um, I was also on the 8 to 10, I mean, it was 3 to 5 US time, but it was 8 to 10 Greenwich Mean Time. And 
it was not funny. I mean, you got to know a lot, a lot of people who would call in and chat about the Royal and chat about everything else. So um, I see, you know, these chat rooms are certainly at these shows are certainly a good idea. I ended up finding a stamp chat guest who had eluded me. I even was writing to the law offices in Baltimore trying to find him. And he ended up in one of our chat rooms. So thanks to The Shield for that. Um, we have the digital philatelist. Some of our friends know him. He is James Gavin. He runs a great site um, and is all over social media. And he's been writing in the chat box. Um, he, he, he's thinking outside of the box. Uh, and he, he's, when he's talking about exhibiting, he, and you can, whoever wants to jump on this, he's thinking multimedia, that there should be a YouTube video introduction, no written text, multi-link web page layouts, Instagram style presentation of images. Why would virtual still restrict exhibitors to a paper page? Anybody wanna take that? From a web master perspective, from a judge, we'd like to hear it all. All right, I, I'm, I'm happy to, to you, hop Ross. out. Great. Because uh, I, I think that uh, there's, there's definitely like a push and a pull in both directions. Um, we've got a strong, like many, many year old uh, tradition of exhibiting. Um, and then we also live in a world where there are lots of things that happen in very exciting, very different ways. Um, and while I agree that on, in many ways, it would be great to, to just like, if I were going to design an exhibit purely for digital, I would probably do it in a totally different way than I might for, for what I would say happened in any of our, our virtual exhibits. But that's not necessarily where the hobby and all the participants are at. Um, you know, it would be great if we could get everybody to design their exhibit in, you know, like really up to snuff HTML5 laid out, like beautiful with video uh, things. But most exhibitors aren't at a stage where they're going to be able to do that where there isn't a healthy body of exhibitors capable of producing exhibits at that level, at that caliber, with that technology. So while I think that's like a, a really exciting idea, and, and personally, I love the idea of a digital exhibit instead of a virtual exhibit, you know, a true digital exhibit. I'm not sure that we're ready to do that, uh, either, either on our end uh, as, as webmasters or on, on the, the end, you know, clients and the users are, are quite ready to assemble, you know, beautiful exhibits in that way. I'm sure there are some people who, who are, and I'd love to see exhibits done like that. But I, I'm sure as some of, some of my other panelists will comment that that's a, a really daunting thing to consider doing. Faroos. Yeah, uh, so, uh, so the, the way I look at it is that uh, I'm actually in the online video conferencing business. That's my day job. Uh, and uh, as the same way as right now, people are working from home and they're contemplating going back to the office. It's gonna be a hybrid model. Uh, or the next one I'm setting up, we're planning on actually doing a hybrid exhibit that has both physical presence in a location, but exhibitors can participate and join virtually also. So all the exhibits will be available virtually. Some of them will be physically in, in, in a location also at the same time. So I think the natural progression of where this might go is gonna be something like a hybrid model, not a full blown digital, but something in the middle that people still wanna to get together, but then you open it up. So there's a much broader spectrum of people who can participate, who can't physically come there or other reasons, but they, they still wanna show and show their collection and show their material. Uh, so given that, uh, the, because it has to be a little bit interchangeable, I think, moving to a pure digital format might not be the sort of right approach at the beginning, but it will be something that you can either put it online or take it to it and put it up on a frame and you will look the same and people will have the same reaction to the exhibit. Uh, so that's the direction I'm sort of looking at going and that's going to be our next exhibit. It's going to be a hybrid exhibit. It's going to be a hybrid show. Joe. Yeah, I wanted to make a couple of comments. Um, you know, this all sounds wonderful if you're a computer programmer. We're having problems with Canpex with people submitting simply a um, an iPhone picture of of their of their you know pages. Um, they don't even know how to do the scanning correctly to get the colors right. Um, so 
it, it would be wonderful if we could have a virtual exhibit that really took advantage of computer technology, of being able to tell a story. That's what I look at, telling a story using all the multimedia advantages of the computer. But what we have most exhibitors can't even submit a 300 dot per inch PDF or JPEG for, for the exhibit. Uh, it, it, it's really asking for just a very, very small specialized group who could actually compete. And we have to make this open to the vast majority of collectors. So how do we get beyond the, the, that technical problem? Liz. Well, one thing to bear is about um, having a hybrid exhibit is one of the reasons why Canage at the moment has not sanctioned virtual exhibits to have WSP status uh, because the judging of a virtual compared to the judging of a physical currently are very different. So it, it's going back to the original question. Somebody said, no, is Canage planning on a virtual training? Yes, but you can't compare apples and oranges. I mean, a digital, inter, uh, an exhibit up on the internet is very different from an exhibit physically, time-wise judging and everything. So I think this is something that we're going to have to address as well. Yeah, Liz, I just want to clarify. Uh, what I said, our, our intention is for judging to be 100% virtual and all of the judging to be done because the, okay. so, the, so the, the entire collection will be online. Some of them happens to be physically in the location you go look at, but I agree with you. The judging is going to be 100% online and the, the judges don't even have to go to the show if they don't want to go to the show. That, that, so that's it. That's, I agree. It should be the same way of doing it. But this way, you can potentially have dealers present in a location, so you can have some of that yeah. definition. I, I, I was just concerned about the hybrid. <laughs> frames, you can show a lot more frames because people are doing it uh, uh, virtually. Yeah. So that's what, I, that's what we were thinking about hybrid. But I agree with you. You cannot judge it both ways. Can I just make a comment about judging? I mean, our experience, albeit a bit limited, is that probably the process we use, which was Zoom-based, and looking at the exhibits as 300 DPI PDFs, uh, which allowed a fair bit of magnification and scrutiny. The feeling amongst our team of nine judges was it was probably a better judging process than the traditional judging process. But picking up Liz's point earlier, some judges got probably far too involved and spent an enormous amount of time. But uh, just to dispel some of those worries about uh, people dropping a couple of uh, uh, metal levels with virtual judging. We found actually that didn't happen in the Australian uh, exhibition. In fact, the standard of exhibits seemed to be higher than we would see at a standard exhibition. And we had a, <clears throat> a larger distribution towards the top end of the metal level. So people didn't seem to um, miss out. In fact, the judges were seeing things that yeah, they might, they might have missed, but they weren't to the detriment of the exhibitor necessarily. I think that the, the one that I was mentioning was, was the first out, so I think it was really early on in the, in the, in the process. Yeah. And Bill. Yeah, I, I was very interested what uh, the Berries was saying there about the hybrid model. Um, I, I'm assuming you're referring to a hybrid model uh, which combines exhibits and also dealers. Uh, yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah, yes. because th this, th this is something that the Philatelic Traders Society is wrestling with at the moment about is, is this going to be possible? Because at, at the moment in the UK, we've cancelled show after show after show. And it's really all quite, and, and that is really quite disheartening, you know, and it's not where we want to go. And at the moment, we are totally committed to organising a physical Stampex this September. However, we, we, we have to have, you know, we, we have to have other options. And I, I'm very interested to see how, how, how bearers, bearers would, would um, envisage, envisage the, the, the combination of a physical uh, dealer's show uh, yeah. with a virtual dealer's show where it, it it's going to be it's going to be very very difficult for for say the dealers to physically man their their stock uh you know if you have a large stand and you've got 
12 people looking at your stock and you've got your computer pinging in the background with questions and people asking for scans of items. Um, I, I, I don't know whether he, he's got any thoughts about how... So how... We're, we're, we're looking at that. I mean, I, my, my first goal was to encourage exhibiting and exhibitors uh, as, as my, that was my primary focus for this, sure. for this concept. And I think uh, the future of exhibiting in general is going to be broader, it's going to be more, uh, it might get up from the confine of the exact judging methodology that we have to people showing what they love and, and a story they can tell. It's going to be broader, it's going to be, on, it's going to be virtual, it's going to be online, it's going to be available. So this will allow that to go. Now for what you mentioned, at least for our first things, we were thinking of that you're going to have set of people who are going to be physically present and that's what they're going to be. They're not going to be virtual. They're going to be in a place. People can show up and do their business. If somebody wants to do it virtually, they can do it virtually at the same time if they want to do or not. Well, we're not going to have you uh, man your dealer booth at the same time, turn around and answer the computer. You need an army of people to do that. So, yes. I mean, that was not our thought. We're going to see how it works out and then we'll see, we'll see if it, if it makes sense or not. But I think uh, just from a pure exhibiting perspective, uh, broadening that, uh, this is this is you know we always uh, are uh, talking and lamenting we're losing collectors and exhibitors. Here's where I we put something up there. I got 50 brand. Nobody's these people. Maybe one of them would have shown up in actual physical exhibit, to be honest. But right now, when I mentioned that we're going to do it, another one. They're all encouraging. This was great. I want to show it again. Uh, how can I make it better? And when we just, so so they are getting encouraged. So this way we can sort of prime the pump in some fashion and then include it further up. Mm. It, but it, I, we certainly don't have the hybrid model sort of worked out. But I think this is that that is in some fashion like that. That is going to be a way of moving forward, bringing people closer together, and actually uh, encouraging more people to join the hobby. Mm. Uh, the, the, the chat box is certainly going crazy. And for our friends who are watching this recording, please feel free to use the comment box to keep the conversation going. Uh, I do want to spend some time, not just on hot button topics like this. It, it's clearly, it gets emotional because it, it, it's the hobby and we've got people who are, you know, diehard digital people. And so let's let's move on and just and table that the fact that we will probably have a, another stamp chat just on this. We have friends who are interested in uh, uh, online exhibiting, and, and let's go to the meat and bones with that. Um, <clears throat> in in virtual exhibits, how is it proposed to handle the risk of getting uploaded scans that have been digitally edited with a little skill in some Photoshop? It's not too difficult to invert that, Jenny. Not that any honorable APMS member would even dream of doing such a thing, but seriously, it's a concern when physical inspection is not possible. Who wants to take that? <clears throat> well, I'll just kick in again getting back to um, the next prospectus that Australia might use. We, as I said, we will be reserving the right to physically inspect uh, exhibits if we have any concerns. And we're fortunate in that a place the size of Australia, we've got a distributed network of judges, people in each state. So it is practical for us to do that. But um, I do think this is one of the risks um, and I don't have the complete answer. Uh, I think it's something we need to pay some more attention to, but um, you know, as I said, it's risk management. I don't, I don't see it as a as a huge issue, but it is very easy to digitally enhance your material. Let me tell you. I think also um, a lot of the judges, we know the exhibitors, we know the material. Mm. If somebody came out with a, another inverted Jenny, when we basically know where they all are, um, that would ra raise some eyebrows. Um, I think probably if the digital would be, um, you know, neatening off rounded corners or something that, um, which we allow nowadays, you can have your cover uh, professionally uh, repaired, as long as you mention that you've had this done. Um, but I, I think, I hope that there is a certain amount of, I think there is a trust in, in the philatelic hobby. Um, we trust each other and we f believe that what we put up on our exhibits is the right thing. And I, I hope that we don't um, encourage people to 
try to play games. <laughs> They'll just chip in there. We certainly in Australia, we would know virtually every exhibitor. We would have seen the exhibits over a period of time. Not everybody, but it's a small community. We'd only have two or three hundred exhibitors. So in terms of managing the trust issue, yeah, it's it's not not a huge issue in a country the size of ours. I can't co uh, comment on uh, a place the size of the US, of course. I'd like to uh, quickly make a dog, you know, left uh, and 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 have the, our webmasters kind of chime in about the the um, what did we have here for a question for webmasters. So, you know, testing and predictive models to determine load speeds. So, you know, a lot of, I know it can, it can really slog down a website. How are we handling this, webmasters? Anybody want to take that? Larry or Ross? Or? I'm actually not handling it. I'm expecting people to have a fast enough internet. I mean, I have gig coming mm -hmm. in and out of my house. Um, and obviously, if you're at a stamp show and you're going to use the Wi-Fi there or use your phone service, it'll be much slower. Um, once again, you know, it, you can download an image at a time and hit the next page or download the whole PDF and leave your phone there while you're shopping at a dealer. Uh, and then by the time you're done, maybe the whole PDF is there and then you can flip through it. So, right. I Ross? I mean, go ahead, Ross. Okay. Is there, um... I feel like I feel like I, I may know who asked that question um, because I recently had a, a very interesting discussion with with a fellow webmaster about this because um, it was a big issue for us. We ended up with uh, over 7000 images in our virtual exhibit, which is an enormous number. Um, and we ended up doing like uh, direct user testing. So uh, one of the ways I, I gauge test speed rate is I just look at like the APS general population of people who come to stamps.org. And unfortunately, most of them are on a, a, a fairly slow by, you know, internet company standards connection. Um, so load speeds always a, a big concern for us. So we did like some, some very basic, you know, predictive bottling to try to just load the images people needed and never load anything else. And to try to load them about half a second before they would actually need them. Um, yeah. I'm sure people still saw loading screens, um, I, I, but we, we did work, work fairly hard to try to prevent that or, or at least reduce that as, as best we could for our users. Because I, I don't know, personally, I find waiting for something to load to be a, a frustrating experience. Uh, just a couple of things. If there are a lot of static images like these, uh, content delivery networks such as Akamai or uh, Cloudflare or other things can help uh, boost the load speed for people. Uh, I think the bigger issue right now is that, that that's going to show up. Uh, but I think the first thing the webmaster should resolve is make sure that the site is responsive. So it adjusts according to are you watching on a mobile device or, or an iPad or a tablet or a computer. Mm -hmm. The, the, the experience, the flow, the way it loads is going to be totally different because your re real estate is different. So the critical thing is to actually develop your website to be a responsive and a responsive site. That will uh, certainly improve the, the way uh, the user experience goes. Yeah, look, we'd, we'd be really careful to use a web host based in Australia, given that's where most of our users are. And I use web hosts based in the US, but the US network's pretty congested and there's a lot of hops between US and Australia. So getting a web host uh, in the geographical area is a good thing. Uh, there's quite a bit of software that'll do lazy loading. Just download the images as just before they're needed, as somebody said, perhaps half a second lag. And um, I'm now looking at um, detecting screen resolution and trying to serve images that match the screen resolution. I mean, we've got a lot of really high res screens these days with really dense pixels and you get a fantastic display on a high res screen, but you don't want to be serving, you know, 200 DPI images to somebody's phone, if you know what I mean. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of software that will do this work now. I think it's just a matter of uh, testing and uh, I'd use the Google uh, online page, page speed tester 
get a pretty good idea. So there are tools out there you can use to get a fix on how things are going. Uh, just on phones, just one thing we noticed was we had 26,000 page views, which was a lot for a, any website I've managed. 25% of the views were coming from phones, 10% were coming from tablets, and the rest coming from desktops. So we've had a fair bit of discussion to say that looking at an, an exhibit on a phone is a waste of time, but uh, picking up Boris's point about responsiveness, I mean, a lot of users are still going to look at your exhibit using their phone and you just can't leave those people stranded. So you do need ways to make sure the phone experience is as good as it can be, as well as the desktop experience. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, the web framework, whatever you're setting up, that will decide for you, so you don't have to worry about it. Sorry, Heidi. Sorry, Liz. Oh, that's fine. Liz. I, I think, I mean, this has been a fascinating discussion, but I think we've slightly lost the point that a lot of our exhibitors are not into uh, high speed internet. I mean, they are, um, should I say, mature citizens. And um, what we've been trying to do with the, with the virtual exhibiting is, is give them the show experience so they can exhibit. Um, but we, we also do need to think about the young people coming along. And so I, to me, it's, it's a two pronged um, road or two a parallel road mm -hmm. as to, to take care of our uh, core community, our vulnerables who can't travel, um, but also to try and encourage new exhibitors with the new medium, I mean, and to get away from our traditional exhibiting. So I think it's, it's a two, it's a dual carriageway and I, and I think it's going to take a lot of effort on both sides to, to get us into an optimum situation. I could just say, we, we noticed the um, social media picked out our exhibition and as soon as uh, it started um, being shared on Facebook, the demographic dropped. I can see in the Google stats, I get a bit of a sense of the age groups that are involved. And the online virtual exhibits do open it up to a different demographic, I think, than the traditional collecting demographic. And that's one of the advantages of virtual exhibiting. Yep. We do have the opportunity to reach out and get a, a younger age group involved. Exactly. And as we're coming down the home stretch, every time it's a it, stamp chat just fly by. And, and again, please uh, keep in touch with us at stamps.org. We will continue this conversation, but let's get to a couple practical items here before we all have to bid adieu. I'm gonna just kind of bullet it. So we've got somebody who would like to know the preferred app for transferring the file. Is it WeTransfer or is it Dropbox? So let's think about that one. Somebody mm -hmm. wants to know, is there going to be a book written? Somebody also would like to know where can they get fine classes? And then also, where is a listing of online exhibitions? Let's go ahead and take those. Um, I'll, I'll take a swing at uh, file you. transfer. Uh, uh, the best solution is always going to be directly uploading from the exhibitors to the site that will be doing the exhibiting because then things are only handled once. Yeah. Um, we, we used a variety of sources to meet the needs of the various exhibitors exhibiting and you know handling thousands and thousands of files that need to be kept in a very specific order and display order uh, can be a little difficult especially when people are using this the save name that is the default save name off their scanner i'll take the uh, virtual shows thank you Liz. um that is on the aps website it is up to um I would say the show committees that are planning on virtual shows. Uh, to my mind, to my knowledge, the next virtual stamp show will be Pipex uh, in May, and they are already working on it. But if you go to the APS website, they keep an up-to-date list of the shows that are being cancelled and the shows that are going virtual. Thank you. Liz. It would be good for APS, by the way, to change the format that you submit uh, your show information to take. The sort of location out and put a URL in place of it. So right yes. now, it, uh, right now, Ross, it's not designed for me to upload anything that is virtual. So I just gave up on that. I'll note that down, and we'll we'll get that uh, to accept links. Thank you. Somebody had written about uh, standardizing 
Um, you know, somebody, and we're going to have to wrap up, friends, but a common format should be required. Sarasota wants PDF files, while Canpex wants JPEG. Can we talk about that? Uh, that's why we're gathering data. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, if, if, it's, if it's proved that, I mean, hopefully somebody will come out on the majority, and that's the way we'll tell people to go. I mean, personally, right now, as Liz mentioned, we have a different spectrum of uh, skill sets. Uh, so I just tell the people, send it however you know, don't worry about it, I'll deal with it. Mm -hmm. uh, because I, actually, I'm not going to put any limitation. As long as we can use it, we'll use it. PowerPoint, uh, <laughs> JPEG, PDF, you name it, it's fine. We'll, we'll sort it out. Yeah, and to add to that, I allowed four different uploading sites. I got JPEGs, I got PowerPoints, and I got PDFs, and I'd split the PDFs into images. And if I got images, I'd create the PDF that way. So I guess it's up to the webmaster to do a lot of the work if you really want the exhibitor to exhibit in your show. I think that that's one thing we haven't mentioned is um, a lot of the shows don't have a large budget. And so they don't have a professional webmaster. And so what we're trying to do is, I think is we, we need to come up with something that the smaller shows um, can use so that they don't need advanced technology to do this. Because I think it's a deterrent when you're looking at a $5,000, I mean, I'm just taking some out of, out of the air, $5,000 to uh, set up a platform for the show to upload its exhibits. Um, the shows don't have that kind of money. And so I think we need to come up with some program or platform Liz, I can, shows. What? I'll talk, I mean I'll, I'll talk to you offline but okay. there are plenty of sites like Squarespace the other ones that manage all the stuff for you you don't need a professional web you don't need to write a single line of code you can put up a show if you really want to. okay this is this is where this is where, where we need to collect the data and, and give everybody this access to this information we didn't spend any money on our exhibition I did all the work Yes, um, you did all the uh, work. I won't say it nearly killed me, but there's no way. I, I had a thousand, a thousand pages, and that was about enough. Uh, but I mean, I mean, I, the problem is trying to find people that have got a philatelic understanding and have yes. also got the skills. Right. And I think there's a, there's a real problem with, uh, you know, sort of getting people with the technical skills uh, around the world to, to do these sorts of things. And the time. And the time, indeed, yeah. Well, we've certainly touched on uh, a, a, a lot of topics in a very short amount of time, and I appreciate it. And clearly, we're going to have to do you know, more of this talking and, as you say, Liz, this data gathering. And I, I really appreciate everyone's uh, passion and uh, expertise and experience and knowing that we're in kind of uh, you know new territory. I, I always like to end on a uh, high note if we can. And there were some humorous comments that we were able to glean from social media. Uh, somebody loves this because they love the low fees and you know who can beat that. And then if an exhibit is virtual, I can read the bottom row of the frames and short people can read the top row. <laughs> do we, and then to which somebody replied, do exhibits actually say things up there in the top row? What a revelation. <laughs> <laughs> and then another comment was great for the mounting crew. No warped frames or bottom screws. Exactly. So, right. <laughs> so I'd like to uh, ask all of our panelists, please, for just you know just a few sentences to conclude you know, their their thoughts, or if they have their contact information that they'd like to share, um, in terms of uh, what to expect, what their belief is um, with the the future of. Uh, uh, online exhibiting. And please, let's start with Baruz Nazare, who I'm, I, I, re, I was remiss in introducing. So Baruz, please. Right. No problem. Anyway, I, I, I believe that uh, we are not going to go back to pre-pandemic era. It's just not going to happen. Uh, uh, virtual exhibiting in some fashion is going to be with us. And that's a good thing. This is going to broaden the entire scope of who can participate. It's going to lower the barrier and we should embrace it uh, to as much as we can uh, to be able to provide uh, uh, an experience that is both available online and in presence. Thank you. Thank you. Larry, final thoughts. 
Um, I think if we want to have things standardized in one way of doing it and for the judges to be able to go from show to show and see the same thing, I think possibly the APS could build a platform that all the shows could use, seeing as we don't want to have 35 webmasters doing all that work with different skill sets, that if they could have the upload mechanism that it has to be whatever it is, images, PDFs, and you click a button and there's your exhibit being shown, possibly you get the same experience at all the shows. So give Ross something to do. <laughs> <laughs> Why don't we go ahead and, and give the baton to Ross now. Ross, final thoughts. Um, well, well th thank you, Larry, for uh, signing me up there. Uh, <laughs> I, I do think it's really exciting. Um, uh, on a note that Peter said, talking about demographics and shifts in demographics, uh, we saw more people under 55 than, than, than you might normally see at a show. Um, and that's really exciting. And, and it does you know, open up the hobby to, to a whole new class of people. Uh, I am really excited. I think standardization is, is uh, a, a very noble goal. I think it's definitely a, a long road to get there. Um, but I'm really looking forward to seeing what what everybody else here like does for their shows through you know the next nine ten months. Um, I'm especially looking forward to seeing some of these great hybrid models. Um, if you guys want to contact me, you can always get my contact information off the APS website and send me all the uh, direct messages you'd like. Thanks, Russ. Joel Weiner, final yeah, thoughts. A couple, a couple of comments. One is that I think the advantages of uh, virtual exhibiting far away any of the disadvantages. Mm -hmm. One of the major things is um, like in Western Canada, we rarely see exhibits from Eastern Canada because exhibitors are don't travel, the costs are too high and they're afraid to ship it. With virtual exhibiting, we can see those exhibits and vice versa. And I think that works ar around the world. So I think there's gonna be a far greater uh, ability to see exhibits that we've never seen before uh, simply because uh, we don't have to travel. We don't have to worry about shipping. We don't have to worry about losses in, in, in that. So I think that uh, those advantages are gonna be a major thing to keep virtual exhibiting going in the future. Thank you. Liz, final thoughts. Um, I was talking to my husband at dinner last mm -hmm. night and he was saying, you know, 10 months ago, virtual exhibiting was something that Australia did and, and South Africa did. And um, wow, has the US sort of caught up? Um, but I, I see it as a positive way to go. I think it's a great way of um, widening our um, hobby of our exhibiting base. Um, I think it's going to be some challenges, uh, particularly for judging. And I'm hoping that with this, we will maybe get some younger judges who um, are used to judging um, virtual. And uh, so it's going to be an exciting 12 months, 14 months as we go forward. Thank you. Bill Barrow, final thoughts. Okay. Well, uh, th th my final thoughts are drawn from our experiences at Virtual Stampex. What was for sure is that the, the virtual stamp X, which was organized by the PTS, was largely commercially driven for our members. One thing we did not do was put enough emphasis on the exhibits and make the exhibit aspect uh, um, very visual. So, so moving forward, uh, we, we certainly see the virtual exhibits as a key component of the show. We, we, we intend to make them much more prominent um, yeah, and, 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 and encourage many, many more exhibitors to, to, to start exhibiting for the first time. Uh, what, 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 I've, what, what I've been in liaising with the people who uh, are responsible for the, the exhibiting part of um, uh, in, in the UK, and they, they have produced a, um, a, a, a guide to uh, starting a new one frame exhibit. And what 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 what, what I, I had a, I recently um, uh, sent out a blog to my mailing list, and I said, hey, you know, we, we, you're all collectors, you're all gathering stuff, but what are you doing? You know, you're not doing much with it. How, how about let's let's look at exhibiting. So I, I'm 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 personally going to try and going to try and encourage many many collectors in the UK to to start exhibiting for the first time. Um, you know virtually all, all, all i want them to do is to tell a story 16 frames here's here's the guidelines and let's have that exhibit in you know uh, at, at the show in march 
So we're, we're, we're being, going to be very positive about moving forward and encouraging a lot more exhibitors. Fantastic. And final thoughts, Mr. Peter Allen. Um, I guess I'd just say in the last 12 months, we've seen a situation where virtually exhibiting is, you know, suddenly it's here to stay uh, as part of the mix. I don't think it will ever replace the uh, physical exhibit because there is a social and networking dimension that some people really love and is very important, but it's definitely part of the mix. I was very reassured to see the FIP have decided they will accept results from virtual exhibits over the next two years in terms of um, eligibility to exhibit at international level. And th there is an important issue here about harmonising uh, acceptance of results between virtual and non-virtual exhibits. And so I think there's a fair bit of work to be done on the judging side, as well as the display side to make sure that both streams uh, are in tune with each other. We don't lose standards. But um, and I guess the final thing I'd say is I, it does worry me a bit. We might end up creating two classes of exhibitors, the old school uh, who are not IT savvy and then the new school who are a lot more IT savvy. So I think one of the things we'd like to do in Australia is to look at some, some training and support to help people make the jump from physical to virtual displays. Sounds exciting. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, it certainly has been very exciting, particularly to watch this chat box. And again, I, I, uh, for our YouTube viewers, please feel free to continue this conversation in the comment box. We do review that. Um, I, I imagine that there is contact information. If you need uh, any further contacts, go ahead. You can send me an email. That's Heidi at stamps.org. And uh, you can be sure that we will continue uh, to, to sort all of this out and start to you know, collaborate with one another and iron the, uh, the future of this out together. I wanna to thank all of our panelists who are coming from around the world. We've had Australia, we've had Canada, we've had the UK, the United States. Thank you so much for joining us. And friends, I hope that you will join me in thanking our panelists for their time and for their efforts in this brave new world. And thank you for joining us and for keeping the chat box going and for your comments. Today's stamp chat was sponsored by the APS Education Department. The Education Department provides videos, learning modules, and teaching resources for philatelists of all ages and collecting levels. Visit stamps.org backslash learn or email education at stamps.org for more information. And that is a great resource for online education. Thanks for joining us everyone. And we'll see you on the next stamp chat until then collect and connect. And of course you can find us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, and on stamps.org. Thanks so much again. Remember we're the American Philatelic so Society Social since 1886. Thanks everyone. Thank you everybody. Bye. Bye. Have a good Bye. Thank you. Bye.